Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Are we on? Thank you, Jesus. Is it on? Hallelujah. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you try that again and give me a... Thank you, thank you, thank you. You are so kind. I so appreciate the warm welcome. You may be seated. I'm so grateful to Dr. Rob and Pastor Linda <clears throat> for having me come speak to you tonight. It's such an honor and a privilege. Uh, I wonder if they could put the first slide up of my family. I want to show you my family. Hallelujah. Oh, yeah. I'm a blessed man, right? <clears throat> I know some of the single guys saying, how does a guy like you get a wife like that? Look at the person next to you and say, some people have it and some people don't. So that's my wife on the left, that's my firstborn in the middle, and that's my daughter on the right, and that's them at the bottom again. We have two children, the, one, the boy is going to be, his name is Jethro Xavier, he's going to be five years old in November, and Shasta Diaz Amira is nine months old, I have been blessed, amen. amen, hallelujah, God's good. I was married before, I was married for 18 years, my wife passed away, we had no children. Uh, you can read a little bit about it on this little daughter card that we have. I write my testi testimony here, but it's an excellent training pack, uh, and it'll really bless you guys if you want to uh, learn about excellence. And tonight I'm going to be speaking from my book on excellence, and I know that you will really be blessed. But I've got my testimony in here that you can read about as well as an extra freebie. It's going to be going in a book that'll be out sometime at the end of this year. But excellence training pack, it's got a student's manual. It's worth, uh, I mean, people pay thousands to, to have me come and speak on this. It's got a training manual. It's got a PDF of the book uh, that I wrote pr uh, prior to this. It's got six hours of DVD teaching professionally done. So you will get to see me. If you like me tonight, you'll get to see me. Amen? Take this home with you. I'm, I'm excited about that. So I'll be speaking to you tonight from this book called Excellence, The High Road to Success, which I've written. Dr. Rob has endorsed this book. How many of you know it's a great honor to have your pastor, your pastor, your pastor, I'll talk American, <laughs> endorse a book. So I'm really blessed, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit about it tonight as you listen to what I'm going to speak about. So I'm speaking to you tonight on Excellence, The High Road to success. Excellence, the high road to success. If you can open your Bibles, please, to 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9. <clears throat> I wonder if we could have a little more volume. I can't seem to hear myself. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs chapter 22, verse number 29, Do you see a man who excels in his ways? He will stand before kings. He will not stand before unknown men. And in Philippians 1, verse 10, it says, so that you may surely learn to sense what is vital and approve and prize what is excellent and of real value. Many years ago, probably about 18 years ago, I had the privilege of, for the very first time, listening to Dr. Rob when he was in South Africa speak about excellence. Never knew about him, never heard his name before. But for the first time I sat in this meeting, there was something about excellence that drew out on the inside of me and touched the very depths of my soul that made me realize that this is exactly what God had called me for. If anybody had asked me what my passion is, it would have to be excellence. If you had asked me what drives me, it's excellence. And ever since then, I knew that this is the reason why God had created me and put me upon this earth. That I would raise the standard and raise the bar of every single individual and bring them to a place where they will have such a hatred for mediocrity that they will reach daily to be better today than they ever was yesterday. And over here in the book of one, uh, Peter chapter 2, verse number 9, it says, But you are a chosen generation. Can somebody shout, that's me. <clears throat> All right. Now, as you know, when you read the Word of God, you have to see yourself in the Word. So if you see your name in Scripture, then you can get a hold of every promise and you can make those promises your own. So every time you see something positive in the Word of God, I want you to shout, that's me. Are you ready? Yeah. All righty. Everybody go. One, two, three. That's me. Okay, let's be a little bit more, more enthusiastic. Say it loud enough to frighten the devil out of your neighbor. Are you ready? All right, one, two, three. That's, That's what I want to hear. All right, let's try it. We're reading the Word of God. Amen. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Now, peculiar means strange. Tell the person next to you, I thought so. 
that you should show forth, that you should show forth, <laughs> or let's try that again, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Oh, come on, give God praise tonight. This scripture has your name written all over it. This scripture is talking about somebody who is called out, handpicked by God, called out of a life that does not reflect him at all into a place where you reflect him. Because isn't it amazing that so many Christians, just about every single Christian upon this earth, know that they are made in the image and likeness of God. Yet when you look at the way they do business, it does not reflect Jesus. The way they, have, they uh, respond to relationships, they don't act like Jesus. The way they deal with their parents, they don't act like Jesus. Why is that? And then why is it that we constantly say we're made in the likeness and image of God, yet we never ever reflect the excellent nature, the excellent character, the excellent attitude of God. And tonight, I want to stir you up to be so passionate about excellence that you will never again ever succumb to mediocrity. Can I have a strong amen tonight? Amen. When we look at the scripture, it's talking about the phrase that you should show forth. It's referring to, when you study the Greek, it says that we should publish and celebrate. That we should publish and celebrate what? It says that you should publish and celebrate the praises. What's interesting about the word praises is that the word praises means valor. It means virtue and it means excellence. So this means that when the Bible says that you are a peculiar people, that you are a royal priesthood, that you are called out of darkness, it says there's a reason why you are strange. There's a reason why you are different. There's a reason why you and I uh, should not be like everybody else. When people look at us, they should see something different in us that they have never seen in anybody else. Can somebody shout, that's me. And so when people look at you, they gotta, they got to understand that there is a reason that you, were, you and I were born. I don't care what people say about the way you were born, the color of your skin. I, I, listen, I come from South Africa. And, and you all know about the apartheid years in South Africa and how everything was bad. But you know one thing that you'll notice the trend uh, across the color line is that the one race that have never complained much about how they were treated is the Indian community, people like me. And, uh, you know, it's not like the American Indians. Uh, that's a different kind of Indian. But the Indians in South Africa is me, right? Now, now I don't mean, mean that in a bad way. I mean, I just, I'm just showing you and helping you understand the difference, right? You know, my wife prayed for a tall, dark, handsome man. How many of you believe God answered her prayer? <laughs> I will have a healing line for all of you who disagree at the end and pray for your eyes. But you know, the thing is that it's amazing that the Indians would never complain because no matter where you put them, they will thrive. And even at the time now that you'll hear across the board, they're saying now it's reverse racism in South Africa. But the Indian community would thrive wherever you would put them because they will never allow the politics of the world to dictate to them the outcome of their life. Because we have been brought up to believe that you can do whatever you want to do, but you will always have the backing of your family. You will have the backing of your community. However, I grew up to, I grew up to find out that, you know, the, the, the moment you hit success, your families are the one that, that get upset first. But it, I, I guess that we got to learn how to focus on what God had called us to do. And so when God says that we are called to celebrate His valor, His virtue and excellence, that means that this is my first responsibility. Before anything else, i got to first, whatever I do, whether I'm in school, whether I'm in college, whether I have a business, whether I'm a pastor of a church, or even if you're a leader in the church, whatever you do, you have to celebrate and publish the excellence of God Almighty. Amen, somebody. Amen. So whatever you do, you've got to learn how to reveal the excellence of God. And so we find here that God is calling us out to, to make sure that we understand that we are called to excellence. I love what Miles Monroe said, Dr. Miles Monroe. He made a powerful statement. He said, the reputation of a king is determined by the lifestyle of its citizens. And now you've got to ask yourself if that is a true statement. What does the reputation of God being revealed to the world by your lifestyle for all of these years? 
What does your lifestyle reveal about the God that you and I serve? What do people see? Do they really see the excellence of the Jesus that we celebrate? Do they see, I mean, if the world has to do business with you, would they know without a doubt that because you're a born-again Christian, that you will do things in excellence because you have an excellent character, you have integrity, that you will never put anything in the contract that will cause them to lose money. And many times I found being a pastor for almost 18 years and traveling and ministering the Word of God. About four years ago, we started a church and I've been pastoring since. But you know, I've counseled, I've mentored, I've talked to people, I've been, I've been even uh, uh, mentoring sometimes uh, Jewish communities. They would come there and they would say, say to me, just, just mentor me. And it's amazing that when I look at the way they run business, many times these guys that come out from the world will say that I never want to do business with a Christian. Because it's the born-again Christian that let me down. And they always say this, but you're supposed to be a Christian. Now, how do you get really mad when people say that? Yeah. Come on, let's be honest. Christians, now listen, Dr. Robbie's not here. We're not going to tell him that you're confessing, right? But even I used to get mad because I've been in business for a long time previously. And I used to get so upset when people say, but I thought you was a Christian. Now, this was way before I even understood what excellence is all about. Because I, was just, I just thought that a quick buck is the way to get rich. And so I never cared about excellence. I never cared about integrity. I just thought, get into business. You'll make the bucks. You'll be rich. And then people will listen to you because money answered all things. And with money, you have influence. Only to find out that every time I got into business, that I would constantly fail in business. Yet I was a leader in the local church. I was a tither. I did whatever I needed to do. But yet I kept failing in business. Why was that? I stood on the promises of God. I declare the word of God, but I still failed in business only to find out that my business reflected the image more of the devil than it did of Jesus. Come on, somebody. And you know, God will never want to promote anybody who claims that they are his child, and yet their lifestyle does not reflect the reputation or reveal the reputation of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And so when I started to change the way I did business and started to keep my word even if it cost me, I cannot tell you how, much, how many thousands of rands I lost uh, in, 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 in business deals just because I made a promise and I uh, signed the contract. But even though things changed over a few months, I had to lose money just to keep my word. And you know, uh, years later, the very same people that I lost money to are the ones that paid me thousands and thousands in business contracts because they said, you're a man of your word, you're a man of character, we will not do business with anybody else. Come on, somebody. <clears throat> That's the kind of life that we need to have. So the first thing, the first principle I want to give you today is that God hates complacency. Can I have everybody say that, please? God hates complacency. Can we have a little more emphasis on the word hate? Tell the person next to you, God hates complacency. One of the things I like to do is this. The way you know you're confessing. Oh, did it fall down? Okay. Why is it doing that? All right. Is my cheeks too fat? <laughs> All right. Now can you hear me? Let's put some emphasis on God hates complacency. <clears throat> The reason why I like to put emphasis on the word is because it convinces me that I too need to understand or believe exactly what I'm saying. Because when I put emphasis on what I'm saying, then I believe what I'm saying. And not only that, the person next to me believes what, you, what you're saying as well. Amen, somebody. Because, you know, if you're going to talk with a soft voice, nobody's going to really listen to you. Amen, somebody. If you're going to just say, God hates complacency. You're going to be, are you going to really believe me if I tell you that God hates complacency? with that tone of voice. But if I tell you God hates complacency, suddenly everything on the inside of me jumps up because I realize, hey, there's something powerful about this statement. Watch what Amos chapter 6, verse number 1 says. It says, woe to you who are complacent in Zion. Woe to you. That means just watch out, be careful. That means something's going to happen and you need to be careful because God hates complacency. In the book of Zephaniah, chapter 1, verse number 12, the New King James says this, And it shall be that in that time I will search out Jerusalem with lamps and punish the men who are settled in complacency. Amen. Watch what the Message Bible says. I love this. It says, On Judgment Day, I will search through every closet and alley in Jerusalem. I'll find and punish those who are sitting it out, fat and lazy. 
Tell the person next to you, he's not talking about you. So you can relax. Amen. <laughs> it's not talking about you. Why? Because you are a person of excellence. Tell, raise your hand and say this. Say, I am a person of excellence. Therefore, this does not include me. Praise the Lord. So here's what fat and lazy people do. They amuse themselves and they take it easy. Tell the person next to you, be careful. Tell the person next to you, be careful of complacent people. They are fat and lazy. And if you hang around them long enough, their fatness and laziness will rub off on you. Amen. Now, now what's it talking about? Fat and lazy. What is fat and lazy? You know, fat and lazy people are those who get the word and do nothing with it. Fat and lazy people are those who just receive the word of God and they do absolutely nothing. They get fat on the word, but they do nothing with it. And then the moment something happens in church, there's a decision that shifts direction. These are the first ones, the fat and lazy ones, are the ones who will be the first to view their opinion. And I don't think this is of God. Oh, really? I don't think that Dr. Rob is going in the right direction. I don't think that they should be doing this. You know what? If you was that smart, if you was that anointed, you would have been in his shoes and you would have been the one running the church. Can I have a big amen tonight? Amen. Oh, come on. I hope Dr. Rob is watching on live streaming to see your response because you are his babies and I don't want to miss, miss you guys up. But I'm telling you what, sometimes all the pastors go through it over and over again. When you talk to pastors, they go through the pain of, of the congregation that they cared for, they loved. And that they, they nurtured and they go through the pain of those are the ones that always have a negative thing to say whenever God gives them the direction of what they need to do within the ministry. But fat and lazy people are the ones that you need to, uh, to, to stay away from because they are the ones that will contaminate you and drive you into complacency. We have to stay away from people like that. The second principle is, this, is that Jesus walked in excellence. Would you look at the person next to you and point to them and tell them, Jesus walked in excellence. <clears throat> Say one more time with, with enthusiasm, please. <clears throat> oh, that sounds awesome. In, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 4, it says about Jesus being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now, if Jesus obtained a more excellent name, a more excellent name, that means that the angels already have an excellent name. But Jesus obtained a more excellent name. Like when you're talking about Cain and Abel, the one brought a more excellent sacrifice. That means they were brought up by their parents to bring excellent sacrifices into the presence of the King of Glory. So they understood that. But the problem is that the one brought a more excellent sacrifice, which tells me the other started to slip into mediocrity. When he came into the presence of God. And we must never slip into mediocrity. Because Jesus walked in excellence. In Hebrews chapter 8 verse number 6. It says, but now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry. Jesus obtained a more excellent ministry. That means that if Jesus obtained a more excellent ministry when he ascended up on high. That means that while he was upon the earth, he had an excellent ministry. Can I hear an amen? Whatever he did, he did it in excellence. Jesus never went halfway in healing. He never went to the lame man and, and prayed for him and, and only from the knee to the hip got healed and the rest was still dangling. Come on, somebody. He never went to the blind guy and just healed one eye and said, you know what? I just can't do the rest right now because I'm really tired. I, you know, I'm, I'm not a person of excellence. So let's just do one eye today. And you know, the next healing conference come, you can come back for you for another healing. Jesus did everything in excellence. He never fed the 5,000 and went halfway to 2,000 and said, the rest of you go home, go and get a, a, a live on the government uh, uh, charity and, and come back in a year from now. Jesus did everything in excellence. He never left anything half done. He did everything in excellence because Jesus ha walked in excellence. Shout amen, somebody. Amen. The third thing is that we are called to excellence. Somebody shout out loud and with emphasis on we, called and excellence. One, two, three, go. We are called to excellence. Hallelujah. You got it now. We are called to excellence. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3, it says, according as, according as His divine power hath given unto us. 
Let's try that again because I lost you somewhere from the beginning of the service to now. According as his divine power hath given unto us that all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that had called us to glory and virtue. Amen, somebody. Here we have again, God has called me to what? To glory and virtue. God has called me to be glorious in all that I do. God has called me to be virtuous in everything that I do. That means my whole lifestyle have to reflect the glory of the living God. That means, you know, people say, well, I'm waiting on God. I'm waiting on God. Have you ever wondered why when you wait on God, it takes long for God to answer? You know, have you ever thought maybe God's waiting on you to do something with whatever you need to do? And, and we have the super spiritual uh, uh, thing, you know, like, like when you promote somebody in the ministry and you say to them, uh, we'd really like you to become a leader in the house of God and, you know, run life groups or run, run home groups or be on the praise and worship team. And then here's the super spiritual dumb answer. <clears throat> I'll go and pray about it. <laughs> now, how many think that's really stupid? I, I hope I get 100% people agreeing with me tonight. Let me, let, me, let me show you why, and maybe I'll get more people to agree. When your boss calls you in and says, you, you, you are promoted today, you never say, i got to go and pray about it. Come on, somebody. You don't ever think about whether you're qualified enough. You never tell him, I don't think I have what it takes. But you jump in, you get excited. Before you even get that increase, you go out there, you find the money, and you take your family out to celebrate your great promotion, to celebrate this awesome promotion that you got. But you never for a moment ever go to your boss and say, let me go pray about it and let me just see, see what God has to say. And I'll come back to you in a month from now. You just jump into it because you believe that you have what it takes to enter that position. Why don't you do the same thing when you're promoted in church? Don't you know if for your leader or your pastor to come to you and tell you that now is the time for you to step in leadership, the reason why they're asking you is because God spoke to them in authority and told them that you have what it takes to step into the position of leadership. And all you got to do is say yes. Come on, somebody. All you got to do is say yes. Stop waiting on God because God is not governed by time, but you are. Come on, somebody. You can go on waiting for God. You'll die waiting for God. You'll enter into heaven and he's going to say, okay, what have you done with your life? I've been waiting on you, God. Really? And yet, you, had, you miss every opportunity that God gives you to become everything that you need to be to reflect the glory and virtue of the living God. Come on. We got to learn how to just be yes people. We got to learn how to just say, yes, use me. Use every gift in me because the moment you step into that position, God has already anointed you, but there's a mantle that falls on you when you get there. I say this, I say this to young people. You know, they say, uh, uh, young couples that's dating, and, uh, and we go through the counseling with them, the premarital counseling, getting ready, uh, you know, to, to train them up and things like that. And then sometimes they'll say like, <clears throat> you know, I don't think I'm ready for marriage. So why are you dating? What, what are you dating for? Just, just be celibate. We'll give you a gown. We'll give you a collar. And you know, if you're a guy, you want to dress like a girl, we'll give you the dress and just, just go out there. Just be celibate. Or, or, or become a eunuch. We can, we can sort that out. We just get a blind guy with a blunt axe to stand in front of you and fix you up. Come on, somebody, if you know what, the, what a eunuch is. But I don't want to be crude with you. But, but you know, sometimes we need to understand that even when you are preparing to date somebody, that you've got to have this, this goal in mind that we're going to get married one day. Amen, somebody. And so when you stand at the altar, I believe that this anointing comes on you that prepares you to be the best husband and the best wife that you need to be. God is gracious. God is kind. Amen, somebody. But God has already prepared you to be an excellent husband, prepared you to be an excellent wife to the man that, God's, uh, that, that, that you, you're dating or the man that you plan to marry. And so when my wife and I started to, to get together and, you know, being Afrikaans, South African Afrikaans, in a time being brought up in apartheid, we're living in a town where they've never really dealt with the oppos the, the, a different color race. She said this to me when we started courting, uh, when we decided we had feelings for each other. She said, I'm, I'm so terrified. I said, why? She says, my dad will shoot you. Now, she was serious because she knows her dad and he would have done that. He would have done that. And so she said to me, my dad will shoot you because she says, my, my family has never heard of this. She said, the town we live in, she says, it's just white people 
all over the place and she says we have never ever heard this in our family history where a, a, a one of us white people fell in love with a brown skin I said well let, let Jesus handle it let come on somebody when you when you let the king of glory handle it the first day that I met my mother-in-law when she when she she greeted me and she hugged me and you know after we got we got uh, got talking and she realized that you know I was a really nice guy in spite of what other people said about Indians but I was a really nice guy you know she hugged me <clears throat> She said to my wife this, well, at that time, my, my fiance, she said, you know, I always wondered what it felt like to hug a brown skin. <laughs> I was the first brown skin she hugged, and it felt good. Brown people can hug good. Amen, somebody. <laughs> we got a lot of love to give. But it's amazing that when you start to think about your life and you know that God plans everything. God has, has everything in store for you. He, has a, your, he knows your end from the beginning. All you got to do is just walk the road that he has chosen for you. And when God stirs up in your heart to do something, just go ahead and do it. Don't make excuses because you are called to walk in excellence. Whatever you do, just do it with excellence because God wants you to, uh, he has called us to glory and virtue. And the word glory means dignity. It means honor. It means praise. And it means worship. So when you praise and worship God, what are you doing? You are fulfilling your calling. Come on, somebody. You are fulfilling your calling. You've been called to glory. And then the word virtue means moral goodness and it means excellence. Somebody shout amen. amen. God has called me to praise Him, to worship Him. He's called me to have dignity in everything I do. He's called me to have honor in everything I do. And God has called me to virtue, to have moral goodness and he's called me to have excellence in all that I do. You see, when you reach for excellence, you've got to have the kind of attitude that God has. Because here's what excellence means. Excellence means to be majestic. It means to be great. It means to be mighty. It means to be gallant. It means to be noble. And it means to be worthy. Everybody, let's say that together. Excellence means to be, first one. Second one. Third. Four. Five, six, hallelujah. Now, I want you to raise your hand and say, I, I am a person, am a person of, excellence. of excellence. Therefore, yes. I am majestic. I am, I am great. I am, I am mighty. I am, I am gallant. I am, I am noble. I am worthy. I am worthy. Oh, come on, give God praise tonight. <laughs> there is something... There is something about positive confessions that makes you believe that God is well able to do through you and I whatever you may desire. Whatever He may desire. God is well able to do whatever He wants to do. And whatever He wants to do has already been pre-planned before you was formed in your mother's womb. And what is excellence? Excellence is to serve as one who is superb, sensational and stunning somebody shout that's me <clears throat> excellence is to serve as one who is outrageously exquisite come on somebody the next one is excellence